Welcome to video number eight in using iTrain. My name is Bob and in this video we'll be discussing blocks, feedbacks and groups. In the previous video we created these track routes that allow us to quickly select a path through a series of turnouts so that we can then drive our trains through them manually. Next we would like to add a visual representation of our locos so that we can follow them as they move through the layout. And we'd like to add some sort of safe automatic control too. Both of these are possible with the use of blocks and feedback sensors. On a real railway a block system is used to prevent train collisions by ensuring that only one train is in the block at the same time. If a block is occupied, a train in the previous block must stop and wait until that block is free before it can then enter that block. In iTrain this is not any different. Blocks provide the safe zone for the trains and the feedback sensors tell iTrain where the trains are. So just like a real railway we need to divide our layout into blocks. There are three aspects to a block in iTrain. Firstly there is what we will call the physical block. That is the section of track on our actual railway and the corresponding section of track on the iTrain switchboard that we will allocate as a block. Secondly there is the block element shown in the toolbar here. This is the graphical representation of the block. It's the viewing element of the block and is used by iTrain to determine its rough position but the block element itself doesn't contain any information about the length of the block. That kind of information is held in the third aspect of a block which is the block control object. And the block control object is what we create with the block editor which we can get to by double clicking on it. But here we would create the name of the block and its description, the type of block and its length and a lot of other information. And when that block is created it is shown in the browser here in the switchboard editor. Here are the three terms described, so you can pause the video and read through this in your own time. Next we'll look at block rules. We need to follow these to ensure that we create the blocks correctly. I've numbered these just for easy reference. It doesn't mean they have any priority. So the first two are you cannot have turnouts within a block and a block can only have one entry and one exit point. So let's have a look at these examples and see how we would split them into blocks. If we were to select this section of track we could make that a block. There are no turnouts in it you've got one entry and one exit point. We could take this section as a block. It has no turnouts in it and there is one entry point and one exit point, assuming that the direction of travel is left to right. This whole section could not be a block because it contains turnouts and there is one entry point and there are at least one, two 
exit points. This section could be a block, but this would not be a block because it contains a turnout and has two entry points potentially and one exit point. If we look at this section down here, if we tried to make that whole section in the middle of block, that wouldn't work either because we've got one entry point here and then one, two exit points and obviously a turnout in the middle. So to make these into blocks we would choose the sections in between. So that would be one block and then that would be another block. Now what if this turnout was a piece of cross track instead of a turnout? So say we had this instead of a turnout. How would we treat this section in terms of blocks? The crossing has no switching like a turnout. So this direction is straight through and this direction is straight through. So if you look at entry and exit points, there is one entry point here and one exit point here. So can you treat this whole section as a complete block? Well, the answer is no, actually, because iTrain treats a crossing as a special case and treats a cross track as if it were a turnout. If you double click on it, you still need to give it a name. You don't give it an address like on a turnout, but iTrain treats it as if it does have two different states, so a bit like a turnout. So, for this example, the blocks would need to be that section and that section without including the cross track. And the last example we'll look at is the siding. So for a siding, the block would be this section here. And the entry and exit point is from the same location. So there is one entry, one exit point. If you have a long section of track, let's pretend that this was an extremely long section of track between the turnouts. You can split the sections of track into two or more blocks. So you could have this as one block and this as another block. Rule number three, a block must have at least one feedback. More is allowed. It must have one and only one block element symbol and it should have one direction arrow element, but never more than one. And that direction arrow should point from next to previous and align with the dots on the block element. So let's have a look at what that all means. Let's say we have chosen this section of track as our physical block. The rule says that we need to have at least one feedback sensor. But if you know it is going to be a block where the train has to stop, it is preferable to have two feedback sensors, which provides greater accuracy for stopping trains. So we could place a second feedback element here, for example, where we place it on the piece of track here is just for our visual benefit. It doesn't provide the locational information to iTrain yet. That is provided by the feedback control object in combination with the block control object, both of which we will do in the next video. A block must have one and only one block element when you place it, try to leave two free squares either side of it. That will then allow enough room for iTrain to display the text information of the block 
in the main window without obscuring any items you've placed next to it. And although not strictly mandatory in all situations, it's also good practice to include a directional arrow. And in fact, you should include a directional arrow in the block if you're intending to stop or start trains in that block. And the rule says that the arrow must point from previous to next and align with the dots on the block element. So let's see what that means. In iTrain, the preferred direction of travel is defined as traveling from the previous block to the next block. So let's say we have a section of mainline track like this and we have a direction, preferred direction of travel from left to right. And we split this into three blocks. We'll have one block here, we'll have a block in the center and a block on the right hand side. So the direction of travel is from previous block to next block. Previous block would be this block here. And the next block would be this block because it's the next block that the train would be entering. And the previous block is the block that the train just exited to go into this block. The dots on the block element symbol indicate the direction of the next block. So they point towards where the next block is. And the direction arrow should always align with the two dots in the block element. So imagine this as being an arrow pointing that direction. Your direction arrow should match it. Rule number five, where possible a block should be longer than your longest train. But a short block is allowed when that is unavoidable. Let's say, for example, that the longest train on your layout is 100 centimetres. You would therefore ideally like to make your blocks at least 100 centimetres long so that the whole of the train can enter the block. Having said that, in iTrain it is okay to have blocks that are shorter than your longest trains because there will be examples of locations on your layout where the blocks are going to be shorter than the 100 centimeter example I've just given. And that's okay. You just need to be aware that a longer train could be overhanging into a previous block which would stop other trains from entering in that block because that block would still be showing as occupied. And the last rule we'll talk about is number six. All items in a block must be grouped using the group keys or the G key. So the last thing you do when you have finished inserting all the things that you want in the block you then highlight the whole of the block and group it either by pressing the assign to group button here or you can use the G key on your keyboard. So I'm going to press G and you'll see that this whole section is now highlighted in orange indicating that all of these items will be part of the group. And then to enter that group you just click on a blank square and then press the G button again and then that group then turns brown to show that has all been grouped together. And you can remove an item from a group by clicking on the item that you want to remove and then either pressing the remove from group button or by pressing shift and G together and there you see it's turned uh, to black. And then to place an item back into a group, click on any part of the group, press the G button 
so that it goes orange and then press the item you want to add to the group so we click on that square and then press the G button again and then that has added it to the group and then click off on a blank square and then press G again until it goes brown. So now that we know all the rules we can quickly place all the elements. You might want to consider using a convention when placing them. For example, feedbacks on the left, blocks in the middle and direction arrows on the right. It just adds some consistency to the look and feel of the switchboard. So we'll place our feedbacks here, highlight the area, press the F key, and then we can do the same over in these sidings, press the F key, and then the blocks we'll place in the middle with the B key, and over here with the B key, and then the direction arrows we'll place here using the P key, and again over here. The direction arrows are all aligning with the dots on the block elements, so there's no need to rotate our arrows. So now we just need to group each of the blocks. So I'll highlight this area, press the G key, and then I can click outside and press the G again to enter it. Or well, there's a quicker way we can do it, which is to highlight the area press G and then immediately highlight the next block that you want to enter and press G again and you'll see it automatically enters that first one and turns it brown. And then we can immediately do the same for this block, G and this one, press the G and this one, press the G and then click outside, press G again, and then all the groups have turned brown so they've been entered. Good, that's everything done for now. That was a lot to digest in one video, so we will stop it here, and in the next video we will define the control objects for the blocks and the feedbacks, and we'll do something with this black area in the middle here. Before we finish, let's press save to save it to the file and then click OK to exit. And then we'll do a file save as and save this as tutorial number eight. Click OK. See you at the next video. Take care.